This is Gary Atensi with CNTV, and today we're in Arvada, Colorado. I am here at the Golden Retriever Rescue of the Rockies. Since 1996, they have been dedicated to the rescue and placement of golden retrievers through the adoption process into forever homes. I am here with Kevin Shipley, who is the executive director. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Let's start off a little bit. I mean, really, for over two decades, the organization has existed. Um, this was something that, that was basically started by one person and has seen some uh, extreme growth I mean, throughout the years. Tell me how it is you got involved in this organization. Well, it, the, like most of us, we have a long winding road that leads us to different places. Um, I had been in the corporate world for 30 years in the tech industry uh, and uh, had taken a year off and began looking to see what I might want to do next. I got involved in nonprofits for about 10 years and then wanted to do something different. And I was actually looking at Colorado nonprofits online and I saw the organization uh, that referred to themselves as GUR. And I figured anybody that calls himself GUR can't be too terribly serious. So uh, I, it all fell together. I live five minutes away and uh, I'm the first executive director they've ever had. That is, that is a fantastic story. Let's start off first of all about this breed of animal. We're talking about an origin from Scotland, England, the UK. That's where the, the dogs come from. The actual name itself, let's educate the viewers a little bit, Golden Retriever. Where do they get that name from? Are these dogs known for actually retrieving? I mean, they're, they're known for hunting dogs? Is that what it is? Well, um, originally, I guess with the English creams, which are the real blonde colored goldens you see, um, they, they were hunting dogs. Um, and contrary to popular belief, retrieving is not a natural instinct for uh, dogs, including golden retrievers. They might chase something, but they're not sure what to do with it on the other end until you teach them. Interesting. I mean, these, these basically, it's a breed that um, they say is, is pretty much easy to train, not only basic obedience, but advanced obedience. Um, so I would say that's pretty suitable for, uh, for a residence. They're very, very good. They're smart, so they do train easily, um, including obedience training, uh, boundary training, all those kinds of things. Obviously, they're a big dog, so you want to have a yard and you want to have uh, exercise for the dog and all that kind of stuff. But they are very, very adaptable dogs. Very adaptable dogs, great for a home, yet we run into the challenge that um, at times these dogs are unwanted, they're surrendered, and that's where this organization comes into play. Why do you think those circumstances exist, and what type of things are you running into why people are having to relinquish? Well, about 70% of the dogs we get are owner surrenders. And uh, those are for a wide variety of circumstances. Uh, everything from something as benign as the, 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 the child got a dog, child went to college, child didn't want the dog, parents didn't want the dog, and we end up with it, um, to really tragic situations where uh, we've dealt with situations where the owner um, died in a fire and the neighbor had rescued the dogs uh, and needed to some place to go. Uh, a lot of people, um, Goldens, like other purebreds, have medical issues from time to time uh, and they can be costly uh, and sometimes people can't afford that uh, so um, just a variety strays dogs that uh, that are just running on the street that animal control picks up uh, so we work in Colorado and the surrounding states to not only do owner surrenders but also animal control when they relinquish those dogs Excellent. Um, basically, why you've been so successful for two decades here is the fact that uh, the real goal is handpicking a proper environment to put these dogs in, making sure you go through an application process, um, and make sure that it's a good fit, if you will. Is that really the, the kind of the secret to the success here? Absolutely. We have a very, very low return rate of dogs, and part of that is because we're very, for lack of a better term, meticulous about our adoption process process. Uh, and uh, you, you might think it's overboard if you go to look at our adoption process, read it, and look at the application. But we are really representing the dog. They've already had a tragic situation. So uh, it may be semantics, but our objective is to make the dog happy, not the person happy. Because if the dog is happy, the people will be happy. Absolutely. But, but not necessarily the other way around. So, so we're very careful about placing dogs um, that we don't have a history of. We don't place with small children, for example. Uh, they, people have to have a fenced yard. Um, older dogs need uh, a residence that doesn't have stairs because they may have hip issues and can't go up and down stairs. So we, we try to really think through the whole process before we uh, place that dog in a forever home. So this isn't a first come, first serve. This is more a, 
whatever suits best, especially because you're talking about each one of the dogs is unique in its own way. They came to you in a, a unique condition, and really, it's your job. You're kind of matchmakers almost, if you will. <laughs> we are very much matchmakers. Uh, uh, we have two employees, myself and then Mary Kenton, who's our caretaker, who lives on the property here. And Mary, as I referred to as the dog whisperer, she is the one that really goes through all the apps, uh, looks at the dogs, tries to make the best match possible. Uh, it is definitely not first come, first serve. Um, it is really the best match for the dog. We get about, oh, 20 to 1 applications per dog that we get in. We've placed over 4,000 dogs since we started and about 300 a year. That is, that is fantastic. Um, let me ask you, let's walk through the process a little bit. We've got a dog out there for whatever reason. Um, someone has to relinquish them. Um, what happens here on the front end before they even are available? I mean, are there medical requirements, general checkups? What, what takes place there? Well, we try to get as much information as possible from the person who was either relinquishing it or animal control or if a shelter picked up the dog and called us or whatever. Um, but that information is not always available. Uh, but like for example, just this morning, we have somebody on Facebook that wanted to relinquish a dog for a very, very difficult situation. They love the dog. Uh, so now we're trying to work through uh, the logistics of transporting the dog from where it's located to us. Once they get here and their little paws touch the ground, um, they get groomed right away uh, and they get a full medical checkup. Grooming is more important than it might initially sound. It's like washing your car and finding every little scratch and ding. Um, it's very much with the dog. We wash the dog. We find out about ticks, about fleas, about wounds, about uh, cysts or tumors and all those sort of things. So it's an important part of the whole process. And then once that happens um, and the medical check is done, we have a chance to really uh, observe the dog over a period of time to pick up any behavioral traits or any other medical maladies that might be occurring. Interesting. What I what I really love about this nonprofit is there are quite a few ways for people to get involved. I mean, there's like yourself, you were looking to get involved, but let's say somebody out there who um, maybe can't uh, handle a dog or want a dog full time, they can be a foster home. Tell me about the program and, and what takes place there. Sure. Um, we have a volunteer application on our website that goes through a number of different um, responsibilities that people can get involved with. Our largest team is the uh, VIP team, which is Volunteer Interaction Program. Uh, that has about 150 people involved, uh, probably 80 very active, and those are the people that come out and help socialize the dogs. Some uh, have a, a rigid schedule. They're in town and they do it Tuesday morning and that's that. Other people travel and they do it when they can, uh, but they go through an orientation so they learn a little bit more about rescue dogs and how the handling of rescue dogs sure. but our dogs get on average about three walks a day uh, which is more than my own dogs get uh, and uh, the grooming and the touching and the everything it really goes into re-socializing these dogs who may be uh, odd to say uh, emotionally wounded having come in here through traumas and so this really makes the dog more adoptable which is great but we have other things we have events throughout the year that people can get involved with uh, be nice. because we're very fortunate to have the facility that we have we, nice. we don't have as much need for foster care as some organizations so it's rare but occasionally we will get a large influx of dogs coming in and we'll need to rely on that um, a beautiful facility you have here. I want to make it known to the public that you guys are open by appointment. I mean, this isn't a place where you come in and drop off that type of thing and uh, set up something that way. You, you're really taking care of all ages of dogs, um, from young to the senior dogs. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the, depending on the person who is looking for a dog, if they're not too specific, I imagine they can be placed a little bit quicker than somebody who's looking for really a, a specific type of situation. Absolutely. You know, senior dogs, uh, for the obvious reasons, are a little harder to to adopt out take a little longer. Um, uh, the most popular request we get is three-year-old trained female, but those by and large are not released to rescues. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I get the reason, but, um, but we do have a lot of dogs that we get in that are under six years old, under five years old, uh, and they um, go through the same process. Uh, they do go out much, much quicker. Uh, and then the senior dogs, uh, we're very careful with placing those in just the right homes, but they are wonderful for people that are looking for a companion dog. Um, they get a little bit of exercise during the day, do a walk, um, but by and large they're looking for a wonderful senior companion dog. They are the perfect dog for that. 
they're just ready to be a loyal pet, basically. Um, let me ask, as far as the uh, people that get in a situation that where they have to relinquish, um, this has to be kind of comforting for a pet owner to have a place where they can bring a dog like that. I mean, because many times it's not by choice. Many times something happens, or the, maybe there's a medical condition, um, and they definitely don't want to be judged through that process. This is a great way for them to connect and uh, know that they're going to end up putting it in a great placement. Absolutely. We encourage people that are thinking about relinquishing their dog to go to our website and take the virtual tour. Um, that is the best way for them to feel comfort uh, from seeing our site, seeing our property, uh, getting an idea about our volunteers, that sort of thing. Uh, we do get a lot of people that um, these days that consider putting their dogs online. Uh, free to a good home or low price to a good home. That is absolutely not the right way to do it. If you're selling a piece of furniture, that's okay. Not a living, breathing creature. Uh, we are professional home finders. That is what we do for dogs. So if they can look at that, and we do have a lot of people that change their mind about listing their dogs and bring their dogs here because they've seen the kind of condition the dog will be in and they have confidence that we'll place the dog in just the right home. That is fantastic. The, um, another way that people can get involved, obviously, is through volunteering, um, be it uh, helping out at events, making phone calls, uh, possibly even helping out walking, this type of thing. Um, how do people get involved and do that? Just go to our website at goldenrescue.com, go over to the Participate uh, link, and drop down to Volunteers, and take a look at that. And there's an application there and an explanation there. There's a myriad of things that people can do to be involved with the organization. We have, right now, we have about 290 people signed up as volunteers all aren't active of course sure. but everything from if you've got an expertise in facilities maintenance and things like that then that's a volunteer team that we utilize um, to events to uh, to the fo fostering to the transport team to the walking to the whatever it is so there's a lot of ways people can get their dog fix even if you're a person that maybe knows quite a bit about social media, I imagine community awareness is big, just letting people know what exists and uh, going through Facebook and making sure people understand um, what is available here. Absolutely. We, uh, we have our Facebook page, um, and we have a uh, Facebook page specifically for uh, what we called Operation Turkey Dog, where we brought in uh, 28 dogs from, that were rescued from Istanbul. And you can read all about that on our website. Uh, but then we also have an Instagram and a Twitter and all those kinds of things. So um, those appeal to different age groups, you know, and, uh, and we do have people that help us with that. So absolutely, a lot of different ways. The stats are basically pretty staggering. Five to seven million dogs nationwide a year that end up in shelters. Um, your organization is definitely doing their part. Um, for two decades, we're nearing now 4,000 dogs that have been placed. We're talking about 300 per year. I mean, quite honestly, that's almost close to one a day. I mean, so you guys, you guys are really doing, uh, putting quite an impact there into the whole big picture. Well, I think so. And um, it's one of those things where you, um, you really can't focus on what you're not accomplishing or can't accomplish. You need to focus on the part that you are accomplishing and what you are doing that's positive. There's 98 Golden Retriever rescues throughout the country. And the one thing we all have in common is we all have a waiting list for dogs. That, that is something. Viewers, take a look at the bottom of the screen right there. What you're going to see, first of all, is their website. Check out the website. It's chock full of information out there. I mean, you name it, there's a way for you to be involved. Um, they've got an application if you possibly want to be a foster home, application if you actually want to um, have one of these great dogs as well, um, applications to be a volunteer, um, many ways to get involved out there. You can also take a look at the, the requirements that are needed, um, learn a little bit more about the organization and the team. This is a nonprofit, so keep in mind that all your donations you give are tax deductible, and it's a great way to basically um, do your part in the community, uh, pretty much like the, the executive here was in corporate America, and this was a way for you to kind of give back, I mean, a way to um, do something outside of yourself. Well, you know, um, I've, I've worked with, uh, with uh, nonprofits in, in various youth causes, medical causes, things like that, 
And uh, I will tell you that uh, dogs are the most appreciative form of life that I've ever discovered that appreciates rescuing more than anybody else. They are uh, through and through golden retrievers. They love to be touched. They love um, the attention. And their whole objective in life is to please somebody. So that's It's got to be very rewarding for you seeing something <laughs> like this happen. I mean, um, quite honestly, you've helped thousands of dogs here locally and uh, in the neighboring states. You've actually even had dogs that are flown in from another country um, here recently. Tell me about that program. Yeah, we got involved uh, in what we call Operation Turkey Dog Colorado. Uh, we have been observing um, a phenomena that had started about a year and a half ago with a uh, golden rescue out of Atlanta. And uh, Istanbul has a uh, horrid uh, uh, dog population. Uh, uh, there's about 50,000, they estimate, uh, stray dogs in and around the city, in the forests, uh, in the streets, in the shelters. The shelters are packed full. The largest shelter over there has 4,000 dogs and they keep about 20 dogs per pen. So it's a really bad situation. People don't adopt from shelters and rescues over there. Uh, so uh, we watched this whole process take place for about a year and let them get all the bugs worked out, if you will. Uh, and then we decided to jump in in December and start bringing dogs over. Uh, this year there'll be 22 different golden rescues involved with the rescuing of these dogs. And I'll tell you, the, uh, the big difference, and one of the questions I get is, what's the difference between goldens that come from that situation to the ones that come in domestically? Uh, the, the biggest difference is, is not their temperament. They are goldens through and through. The biggest difference is that so many of the dogs that come in domestically uh, respond to food, right? Okay. Whereas these dogs from Istanbul respond to touch. That is their reward system. Uh, and so if you want to praise one of these turkey dogs, as we call them, um, then start off by uh, teaching them something and then praising them and petting them because that is their major reward. And, uh, but they are remarkable dogs. They are remarkable these, dogs. These dogs back in, in that country there, um, it, was, it was known for nobility almost to have a dog mm -hmm. like this. And uh, a lot of that has changed. So therefore, um, you're seeing more of these that, that need homes like that. That is a great way. This is, this is really a um, mission that began one dog at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when a person looks back now over two decades, 4,000 dogs later, um, it, it probably it gets overwhelming on our day-to-day basis at times, yet if you look at each one being placed like that, really got to warm your heart and make you feel that uh, you probably enjoy coming to work. Oh, you know, I'll tell you, there's nothing better than to um, bring one of the dogs over to hang out with you in the office for a day. It's good for them because they learn social skills. They see people and dogs coming in and out all day long, so they get used to all of that. And I can't tell you what it does for my temperament as well. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is absolutely right. Viewers, last time, take a look at the bottom of the screen right there. What you're going to see is their website again. This is an organization that began back in 1996. They have flourished and basically grown throughout the years, not only because of the volunteers and the team here, but also because of the support of the community. Make sure they have events out there. Check them out on Facebook. Like them there. They'll give you, uh, let you know what events they have. There are many ways to basically give out there, from the Golden Angel Fund, buying merchandise. Uh, they got a name tribute that you can be a part of there. These are all ways that you as the community can basically um, support what is going on going on right here in Arvada. That is the Golden Retriever Rescue of the Rockies. This is Gary Atencio with CNTV. And if you don't know, now you know.